Cardioversion is a recommended approach to convert atrial fibrillation or flutter to sinus rhythm in patients with persistent non-valvular atrial fibrillation who remain symptomatic despite rate control therapy or in whom rate control therapy does not control symptoms and who are unlikely to convert spontaneously. Cardioversion can be accomplished electrically or pharmacologically using antiarrhythmic drugs. Electrical cardioversion restores sinus rhythm in approximately 85% of patients with atrial fibrillation, and pharmacological cardioversion has success rates of about 70% in patients with recent onset AF. By virtue of restoring sinus rhythm, cardioversion can also improve AF-related symptoms. Effective anticoagulation is required before and after cardioversion procedures. This is because of the increased risk of stroke during the pericardioversion period, irrespective of CHADS-2 score. Notably, the one-month risk of stroke or systemic embolism has historically been estimated at 1.9% with no anticoagulation versus 0.36% with warfarin based on observational trials. More recent RCTs of non-vitamin K antagonist oral anticoagulants, or NOACs, suggest that the rate with warfarin is 0.46% and 0.31% with NOACs. This benefit is balanced against the risk of major bleeding associated with anticoagulation, estimated at 0.67% with warfarin and 0.58% with NOACs, based on RCTs. The increased risk of stroke during the pericardioversion period can be conceptualized as two distinct mechanisms. The first is the generation of thrombi during persistent AF with subsequent embolization after restoration of atrial contraction. The second relates to a period of atrial stunning, a variable duration after the restoration of sinus rhythm, leading to the formation of new thromboembolism post-cardioversion. This is why effective anticoagulation is required before and after cardioversion procedures. The 2018 Atrial Fibrillation Guidelines were published in the November 2018 issue of the Canadian Journal of Cardiology and are an update to the 2016 AF Guidelines. This algorithm outlines the decision pathway for oral anticoagulation therapy before and after cardioversion for atrial fibrillation or flutter. Let's take a closer look at each step in the algorithm. Patients with an unacceptably high risk of thromboembolic complications should be initiated on oral anticoagulation at least three weeks prior to a planned cardioversion if they meet the criteria listed here. The CCS recommends that in addition to appropriate rate control, most hemodynamically stable patients with AF or atrial flutter for whom elective electrical or pharmacological cardioversion is planned should receive therapeutic anticoagulation for three weeks before cardioversion. It's important to remember that non-valvular atrial fibrillation, or NVAF, is defined as AF in the absence of mechanical heart valves, rheumatic mitral stenosis, or moderate to severe non-rheumatic mitral stenosis. When early cardioversion without a preceding period of therapeutic oral anticoagulation is desired, transesophageal echocardiography, or TEE, can be performed to exclude left atrial thrombi. This approach has been associated with a significantly lower rate of bleeding events, a shorter time to cardioversion, and a greater success rate compared to a conventional three-week treatment with warfarin. The CCS suggests that TEE may be used to exclude cardiac thrombus as an alternative to at least three weeks of therapeutic anticoagulation before cardioversion. For the hemodynamically unstable acute AF, the CCS recommends that immediate electrical cardioversion be considered for patients whose recent onset AF or atrial flutter is the direct cause of instability with hypotension, acute coronary syndrome, or pulmonary edema. This recommendation places a high value on immediately addressing instability by attempting cardioversion and a lower value on reducing the risk of cardioversion-associated stroke with a period of anticoagulation before cardioversion. Patients with acute non-valvular AF or flutter of less than 48 hours duration have traditionally been considered to have a low risk of thromboembolic events after cardioversion since left atrial thrombi have not yet had time to form. 
evidence suggests that it might be possible to identify a population of patients in whom pre-procedural anticoagulation for three weeks might not be needed. The CCS suggests that pharmacological or electrical cardioversion of symptomatic AF or AFL without at least three weeks of previous therapeutic anticoagulation be reserved for patients with the following characteristics. Patients with NVAF who present with a clear AF onset within 12 hours in the absence of a recent stroke or transient ischemic attack within six months. Patients with NVAF and a CHADS-2 score of less than two who present after 12 hours but within 48 hours of AF onset. When a decision has been reached that a patient will be undergoing unplanned cardioversion of AF or atrial flutter, the CCS suggests that therapeutic anticoagulation be initiated immediately, preferably before cardioversion, with either a NOAC or with heparin followed by adjusted dose warfarin. Regardless of the pre-procedural duration of anticoagulation, all patients should be anticoagulated post-cardioversion. The CCS suggests that in the absence of a strong contraindication, all patients undergoing cardioversion of AF or atrial flutter receive at least four weeks of therapeutic anticoagulation after cardioversion. Thereafter, the CCS recommends that the need for ongoing antithrombotic therapy should be based upon the risk of stroke as determined by the CCS algorithm, or CHADS-65. This approach places relatively greater emphasis on the benefits of stroke prevention in comparison to the risks of bleeding with a short course of anticoagulation therapy. Although it may be possible to parse these risks based upon either patient characteristics or the duration of acute AF or atrial flutter, the CCS AF Guidelines Committee has chosen to simplify at this point by recommending anticoagulation for one month after cardioversion for all such patients in the absence of a strong contraindication. When oral anticoagulation is to be used for only a short period, such as less than two months, current evidence does not substantiate either an efficacy or safety advantage for use of a NOAC over adjusted dose warfarin. Nevertheless, the convenience of using a NOAC over adjusted dose warfarin in the pericardioversion is substantial. The onset of therapeutic anticoagulation is nearly immediate with a NOAC, while being delayed in the case of adjusted dose warfarin. Accordingly, it is reasonable to use NOAC therapy in the pericardioversion period. Let's recap. In patients undergoing cardioversion for atrial fibrillation or flutter, most hemodynamically stable patients with AF or atrial flutter for whom elective electrical or pharmacological cardioversion is planned should receive therapeutic anticoagulation for at least three weeks before cardioversion. When early cardioversion without a preceding period of therapeutic oral anticoagulation is desired, TEE can be performed to exclude left atrial thrombi. Cardioversion of symptomatic AF or AFL without at least three weeks of previous therapeutic anticoagulation should be reserved for patients with hemodynamically unstable acute AF or NVAF less than 12 hours duration if they have no recent history of stroke or TIA, or NVAF of 12 to 48 hours duration with a CHADS-2 score of less than two. After cardioversion, all patients should receive at least four weeks of therapeutic anticoagulation with dose-adjusted warfarin or a NOAC to reduce the risk of stroke or systemic embolism. Thereafter, the need for ongoing anticoagulation should be based on the CHADS-65 algorithm. The full atrial fibrillation guidelines cover several additional topics beyond the use of anticoagulation in the context of cardioversion for AF, including those listed here and many more. For information and other topics related to the management of AF, visit the CCS's eGuidelines website. The eGuidelines site allows users to quickly browse, search, and filter the CCS's most sought-after guidelines. Thank you to the many volunteer experts who've contributed countless hours to atrial fibrillation guideline development and dissemination.